Let me start out today with part two of our family Christmas series. Does anybody in here is going to date you? All right, it's going to date you. You're going to you're going to know you're a little older if you say yes to this. But does anybody remember a movie called Home Alone? Like, that's not that old. It came out in 1990. I was talking to a teenager the other day. And I said, hey, you ever heard the movie Home Alone? They're like, yeah, isn't that from the 1900s? <laughs> We're there, ladies and gentlemen. We're there. The 1900s. 27 years ago this movie came out, right? It's about an 8-year-old Kevin McAllister who lives with a wealthy family in his, in his large house in Chicago. And for Christmas, the family's taking a vacation to Europe. And as all the relatives show up and there's this confusion in the house, Kevin is in that in-between stage where he's no longer cute, but he's not mature yet. He's just kind of like in that annoying stage. And things start getting out of control. And he's, he's you know, going crazy in the house. And his mom punishes him, and she sends him to the bedroom in the attic. And as he's in the bedroom in the attic, he gets into an argument with his mom. And he says, I wish I was never brought into this family. I wish I was never part of this family. And in the, uh, the next morning arrives and everyone wakes up late. So there's this chaos happening as they're all getting ready to go to the airport. And they forget about Kevin sleeping in the attic. All the while, the parents believe that Kevin's actually with them. You know, maybe he's hanging with the cousins. Maybe he's in this car or that car, whatever. Kevin finally wakes up to find that he's home alone. And if he was a good Christian kid, he woke up and everyone's gone. He thought the rapture happened. <laughs> right? And so he believes that his wish came true to his delight. He's home alone. And so now, being home alone, he's got the run of the house. He can eat all the junk food he wants to eat. Uh, he doesn't have to answer to anyone. He can do whatever he wants. He can watch whatever he wants on TV. He can go through his, bed, his brother's bedroom and snoop through everything. He can do embarrassing things like dance through the house with just a towel on, right? He can even order pizza, have it delivered to his house, and no one can tell him no. He can do whatever he wants to do. Kevin's life begins to have some added excitement when two crooks come into the neighborhood, Harry and Marv, Marv. They're robbing houses in the neighborhood uh, while most families are away on vacation and Kevin's house is next. In the movie, of course, we laugh hysterically as Kevin sets booby traps, paint cans flying down the stairs and marbles on the floor and all these sort of things. And, but as he succeeds to booby trap this house and defeat the robbers, he begins to have a problem. Being home alone is not what he thought it was going to be. And he finds himself walking down the street and passing a house full of a family, having dinner and laughing and music playing, and he realizes that he's lonely and begins to regret his decision and just wants his family back. So today I want to ask this question, have you ever felt lonely? Have you ever felt lonely? And it's funny because there has been times that I have felt so alone in a crowd of people. In a crowd of people. People who love you all around you, yet you feel alone. Lee Strobel, in his book, God's Outrageous Claims, said that people today will admit almost any problem. Drug use, divorce, alcoholism. But there is one admission that people are, both, are, are loath to make. Whether they are a star on television or a television repairman, they're just too embarrassed to make this admission because it penetrates too deeply to the core of who they are. He says this, people don't want to admit that they are sometimes lonely. According to Los Angeles psychiatrist Dr. Leonard Zunin, despite the fact, now this one blows my mind, Despite the fact that the average American meets as many people in one year 
as their ancestors did in a lifetime a hundred years ago, loneliness is the main problem facing Americans today. I would even go on to say, we are more connected to each other than ever before, but the loneliest we've ever felt. Somehow, looking at someone's status or someone hitting a like button on our page is supposed to somehow fill that loneliness tank, and it just doesn't happen that way. Uh, some of the biggest fights in our house have been over this thing. Sitting on the couch, should be having a conversation. But I'm in my phone, she's in her phone, the kids are in their phones. Even the four-year-old's in his iPad. <laughs> Nobody's talking. And we find ourselves, I mean literally, honestly, I almost threw these things through the window the other day. We're all sitting in a room. And we texted each other. <laughs> Literally five feet away. And instead of just opening our mouths and saying something, the family, in a family chat, is texting each other. I just thought to myself, how pathetic we are. I got literally started beating myself up. I was like, this is the dumbest thing that we've ever done. Stop. Shut everything off. Loneliness is a common everyday experience for a lot of people. And the feeling of loneliness is actually compounded at Christmas time because it's the time of year when families get together and everyone exchanges loves and joy and all these things, except when it doesn't happen that way. In fact, here at Family Church, it's a blackout month for our staff. We are not allowed to take vacation in the month of December at all because we know that families need church and the church connection the most of any time of the year, believe it or not. But the feeling of loneliness at Christmas is nothing new. Think about the very first Christmas. We're talking about when Mary and Joseph find out that they're going to be parents to baby Jesus. Okay? Specifically today, we're going to talk about Joseph. We're going to specifically talk about how lonely Joseph must have felt in this moment of his life. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. It will also be up on the screen behind me. This is at the end of the genealogy that we spoke about last week. At the end of this genealogy, 17 verses, talking about where Jesus came from, it says this. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, you know what that means, right? Okay. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. For real? Let's just assume you don't know this Bible story. Let's just assume you don't know how this story goes. Let's just assume that this is your 15-year-old daughter. And she comes home and she says, Mom and Dad, I'm pregnant. How are you responding with that? Oh, congratulations! What a blessing! 15-year-old daughter. What are you going to do? I know if you're Hispanic, what's going to happen? Straight up. Chancleta coming off. Spanish words that don't even exist are going to start flying out your mouth as you're swinging that thing at them, right? But, but Mary says, wait, 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 mom, 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 dad, it's okay. God did it. God did it. Santo, oh my God. <laughs> Use the Lord's name in vain. Say the Lord did it. Oh my God. For real. Now, so let me ask you I don't care what generation this is in. You believe in this story? You're, all, you're only saying yes because you're a Christian and you know this story. I'm asking your 15 year old daughter today comes home and says, I'm pregnant, but it's okay. God did it. 
God chose me. God, God chose you? I heard what you were saying to your brother just five minutes ago, and God chose you? You can't even make your bed, and you're going to take care of a baby? Come on, think about this for a second. How are you going to respond? She's engaged to be married to Joseph, but she's found to be with child by the Holy Ghost. Let's continue reading. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What did he have to be afraid of? Mm, maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't know the situation here, all right? Do not be afraid to take her home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. That's probably the most powerful sentence in the whole story. That he actually agreed to this plan that God set in motion in front of him. And he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And they gave him the name Jesus. How in the world did Joseph feel when he found out that his future wife was pregnant. And he knew he had never been with her. Heartbreak. Betrayal. And then beyond that, God did it. So you don't even have God to go to to talk about the situation. Because you're mad at God too. Just one thing. One thing, God. You take this from me. You're going to take this from me. I'm just, I don't know what's going through his mind, but I know I've been mad at God before. I know I've questioned God before. I know I, I've asked, I've prayed a hundred times for this. How come? And that could be a very lonely feeling. Who does Joseph go to? Can't go to his parents. Talk to them about it. Can't go to her parents. Can't go to his buddy because he doesn't know if he's going to get turned in. See, I don't know if we know the depth of this situation. You see, the culture of dating and marriage was much different in ancient Israel than it is today. People didn't meet and fall in love and go for coffee and date for a while and get married. and They didn't do that. Marriage back then was a business proposition. The dads would get together. And the one dad said, okay, I'll give you uh, five horses, two donkeys, three sheep, and 22 acres for your daughter to marry my son. And they hooked him up. That's how it was. It was business. Straight business. Okay? In our passage here, Mary and Joseph were in the stage of the process of marriage called betrothal. Okay? Which lasted anywhere from six months to a year in, in, this, in this engagement process. Betrothal, though, was, it was marriage. You were married. You just hadn't consummated the marriage yet. So to end a betrothal wasn't just like you took the ring off and said, I don't want to marry you anymore. You had to go through divorce proceedings. You had to do it legally and, and end the relationship. Okay? So very little is listed in the Bible as to what Joseph was feeling, but I think we can only imagine how heartbroken and the feelings of betrayal must have been flowing through his body. He probably wondered, what kind of gossip is going to be said about me? Because everyone's nice to you in your face, but then as soon as you, yo, that's Joseph, you heard about his wife. Heard about that girl? What's going to be said about him behind his back? 
because Nazareth was a small town. Things got out quick. Nothing's changed much in society over time. Joseph had to come up with a course of action for this unpleasant situation. And at this point, Joseph wasn't only battling earth-shattering emotions, but he had this compounding sense of responsibility to make the right decision. So here's his dilemma. Here's what I think we don't know about what's happened to Joseph. As a righteous man, meaning one who followed the law, Joseph could no longer, he could not complete the marriage contract. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. As a righteous man, he could not complete the marriage contract. He could not marry a woman who was pregnant with a child that was not his. It's against the law. Being against the law means that he would be guilty of breaking the law if he married her. Secondly, marrying a woman, carrying a child known not to be his child, would reflect so badly on him and his entire family that, remember we talked about this last week, his name could be taken out of the family tree. It could be taken out of the genealogy because he disgraced the family by marrying a woman that was carrying a child that was not his. That changes things, doesn't it? That changes why he sat back, and it was never in Joseph's mind to work it out. We said it back in our text. He considered in his heart to put her away quietly. He wasn't trying to work this thing out. He had already decided it's over. It's done. Much like the situation would probably be in our relationships today. I mean, you cheated on me, and we're not even married. We're still dating, and you come home pregnant with someone else's kid. Think about it. This is not going to get any better as we move ahead. We're talking completely natural here. Just think naturally. I know it's easy to get caught up in what we've always been taught about the Christmas story and how godly this whole thing was. I'm trying to think of this dude as a man today. He's bugging out. He's bugging out. So Joseph has two options. Option one, accuse Mary of adultery, adultery and let her face the consequences. So in this case, a divorce would be granted because he's accusing her of adultery. But there would be dire consequences. You see, in many countries, uh, in, in a time of adultery, it was considered a heinous crime. And so there would be a punishment that would fit that heinous crime. Are you ready for this? In Egypt, they would cut the guilty woman's nose off. Right off her face. Cut the nose off. So now, you see a woman walk around no nose? You know. You know what she did? Bam, right there, right on her face. In Persia, they would cut their ears and nose off. Israel, where they are now, your family would take you out into the street and stone you to death. Okay, so... There's option one. Joseph let everybody know what she did. So then, so then who do you talk to? Because if you don't want that option, you can't tell your mom and dad. Because you know your mom and dad, what they're going to do. They're going to call her all sorts of names. They're going to get all crazy and they're going to go report her. So he's like, I, I, I need to do the right thing. So option two is this. Put her away quietly. And using this option, a divorce would also be granted but no reason would be given for the divorce. During this time period of betrothal, no reason was needed. All a man had to say was, I divorce you, and it would begin the divorce proceedings. That it's not like today where you have to fill out forms and you know, accuse each other of something and why and explain it and blow and get lawyers. No, they just sign off on it, tell you why, and then go into the divorce proceedings. He never considered working it out. He was done. He was gone. He was out of here. So that was the situation that Joseph faced. He could rightly have Mary executed, or he could 
mercifully put her away. How alone does he feel right now? I can't even imagine. Who do you, who do you go to? Who do you turn to? Who do you talk to? Well, see, that's when you, that's when you lean on the Lord. The Lord's the problem. He's the problem. That's the situation. If it wasn't for that, we'd be fine. Right? Mm. At this point, he feels all alone. He's at his breaking point. He's, he's at that spot where he's just like, man, I almost rather die than have to deal with this. And it's then that an angel appears to him. An angel appears to him in a dream and tells him, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. He awakes and realizes that he was never alone. He was never alone. That God was actually with him the entire time, protecting him and providing for him. That God's grace was there to strengthen him and give him guidance. That God didn't abandon Joseph in this lonely and stressful situation in, in life. But, but here's the problem as I see it. Joseph's plan for his life did not match God's plan. And I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I really like God's plan for this situation. I wouldn't want to have to go through this. I wouldn't want this to be the road map to what God's called me to do. Because in that moment, right then, right then, my heart is breaking. My heart is hurting. Because all I have is the trust of a dream. That this is what God wants me to do. What do you do when your dream doesn't match God's plan? I mean, Joseph was a carpenter. He had a little woodworking shop. He's like, Mary, we'll get married. We'll build a nice little cottage out in the back. Have a couple kids. You know, with all the animals that your dad gives us for marrying you. We're set. We're good. This just messed it all up. This took Joseph's whole plan and flipped it upside down. It didn't match Joseph's plan. I asked myself, how could God call Joseph to this life? But I don't know if we actually realize the rest of the story. That God would never ask you to do something that seemed inconvenient if he wasn't willing to bless you in an extravagant way. Never. Never. God would never ask you to do something that seemed inconvenient at the moment if he wasn't willing to bless you in an extravagant way because of it. And and you got to believe that. you got to believe that. you got to believe that if God's leading you into something that seems hard, that seems outside of your range as to what you could actually do and actually accomplish, he's just looking for some faith to put his blessings on. He's looking for a way for you to open a door for him to bring a blessing that you could never have imagined. I feel bad for Joseph. I do. Until I read how big God blessed him. Let me ask this question. No, Harv, don't shout out. We know you know the answer, Harv. How many wise men, you know, we three kings of our, you know those three wise men who brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? How many wise men were there at the manger? It is a trick question. How many wise men were there at the manger? You know where Jesus was at the little manger? None. None. There were no wise men at the manger. The, the, the wise men came two to three years later. The wise men saw a star in the east. They followed it. They went to King Herod. They said to Herod, we followed the star in the east. And he says, great, I want to find this king. And when, he, when King Herod found out that the magi never came back with, with the baby and all that, he, he made a decree, kill every child two years and younger. So we know it was in that range, that age range of two years. 
and it says that the wise men arrived at their home, not the manger. Crazy, right? That just messed up your whole nativity scene at home. Now you got to take the three wise, ah, ah, put them like two years away. How come the wise men are still, oh, they're traveling still. All right. Another question. How many wise men does it say are in the Bible? How many actually showed up to their house bearing gifts? How many? The Bible doesn't say. Isn't that crazy? We got this whole thing drawn out. Oh, there were three. We got songs. We three kings of a. The Bible never says there was three kings. Never. It says they. That's it. They brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's it. So somebody, somewhere, said, oh, since they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, there's three of them. Each of them brought a little tiny little thing. I mean, look at, look at your nativity scene. Literally. <laughs> you're telling me, you're telling me that these guys traveled halfway around the world for two years to bring four gold coins. You brought, you, you brought a young living oil container you traveled two years, and you brought an ounce and a half of myrrh and frankincense. Wonder if there was a hundred wise men. Wonder. Wonder. Go there with me. Wonder if there was a hundred wise men, each of them having a carriage full of one gold frankincense, and myrrh. They, they think about from that moment, Jesus was provided for. And he was provided for in a lavish way. In a lavish way. You see, because even God the Father pays child support. Don't use that one in your court proceedings. <laughs> I hear it now. Your Honor, even God pays child support. This man. <laughs> Woo. Dear God, gold. For we know that Jesus wasn't poor. Because he never did a campaign to raise money for his ministry. He had a priestly garment. They said he had a priestly robe. A priestly robe was the most expensive garment that could be made. The hems were sewn out of thread of gold. It had rubies and gems and diamonds and all sorts of things in compartments on the robe. I mean, it was the most lavish. How did he pay for that? His daddy God Provided it as a birthing gift, as a, as a, what do you call that? With the baby shower. <laughs> Gold, frankincense. You know, frankincense and myrrh is used in the embalming process back then. So God the Father, from the time Jesus was born, provided everything he would ever need for his life, his mission, and his death. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See, I can feel so sorry for Joseph until I realized that God's plan gave him a workshop he could have never have imagined. It paid for a house that he could have never afforded to build because he said yes to God. He said, he said yes to God. And as much as that excites me, knowing that if I say yes to God, he'll honor me and he'll bless me, that excites me. 
It excites me to know that if I'm faithful to do what God's called me to do, even though it doesn't seem like it's being successful right now, that God will grow it in time because I, got, I know that God has to grow my character before he can grow my ministry. I understand all those things. That's not what excites me about this whole story. What excites me about this whole story is what we did not finish reading last week. Last week we're reading the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus' family tree. Look with me back in Matthew chapter 1, the last two lines in Jesus' family tree. It says, Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathen. Mathen, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. But Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, not Joseph. Joseph wasn't actually Jesus' daddy. He raised him. But God was Jesus', Jesus dad, biological father. Mary gave birth to Jesus, but it's not Mary's genealogy. It's not Mary's family. It's not Mary's father and grandfather and great-great-grandfather. It's Joseph's. Isn't it crazy that by Joseph saying yes to marrying Mary, which should have had his name blotted out of the family tree, by saying yes to God, God put him in the genealogy of Jesus in a line that he didn't belong. Joseph was the stepdad. He don't get listed in the genealogy of the son that he didn't birth. It wasn't his bloodline. It was his faith line. It was his faith line. I don't know if maybe you've come from split homes or broken homes or half siblings and quarter siblings and all these different kind of things that are out there today. But this scripture right here gives us some crazy hope. That God can put a family back together. That God can, take, God can take something that we name one thing and he can name it something else. Come on, we talked about this a few weeks ago. We can name it something else. He, he, his name should have been shamed for marrying this girl. But he's famed. He's famed. He's put in a place where he's in the genealogy of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That it's credited unto him coming from the house of David to be his son. And all he really had to do is say, yes, I'll trust you, God. Even though I'm lonely right now, even though I'm mad at you, I'm, I'm angry. Could have picked somebody else. You could have picked anybody else. Yeah, just, but I want to bless you. I want to make your name great. Do you know where we miss it with God? We miss it in the process. I think it's a name we don't like, process. Because when the process gets tough, many times we like to jump ship. What I'm going through in, in, in this training time, in this grooming time, it just, it's so hard. I don't know if this is what I signed up for. I just wonder how many times we don't trust the process. Growing something takes process. Becoming something takes process. Having a strong relationship with God is a process. Understanding his calling for your life is a process. But if we say yes, we can understand that he promised he would never leave us nor forsake us. I got to give you this truth. Something I learned, I don't even know how many years ago, 20 something years ago. It's when I said yes to God. I was in a rough time in my life. I was like 17, 18 years old. I was very I was suicidal. I didn't know what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. I know I did not want church. I knew I didn't want to be a pastor. Um, yet, everything in my life always pointed, son, this is going to be yours one day. And that's it, my breath, but I don't want it, you know. 
and I was at a teen camp one year. Teen camp is when we go away for a week as a youth group with people your own age, and you do a lot of church, but then you do a lot of activities, and I snuck out of my dorm room one night, and right there, that's a carnal sin. You're going to hell if you ever sneak out of your dorm room at teen camp. I snuck out of my dorm room at teen camp, and I went up in the woods on the hill behind the cabins, behind the dormitories, and uh, I was smoking some of my Marlboro Lights. That's another mortal sin, if you ever, just kidding, it's not. But I felt it was at that time. Like, at that time, I knew I was like, that was bad, I was being bad, you know. I went up there, sitting on a hill myself, broke out of the dorm, smoking my Marlboro Lights, Having just this moment where I'm like, I'm done. I'm legit done. And I can't explain this. And, 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 and don't take this as like me being some super spiritual person or something because I can't really put into words exactly what happened. But I felt God come sit next to me. And there was this holy like fear that filled me. And I was like, what are you doing here? Straight up, what are you doing here? Had this kind of, what are you doing? Here? What are you doing here? Because I know I've been taught my whole life that you're doing sin. God breaks fellowship with you. God can't look at you. God walked away from you, and I'm in the middle of sin, and He chose to come sit next to me. What are you doing here? Tears coming down my face, getting angry. What are you doing here? And I'll never forget, it changed my life, and it's why I do what I do today. He said to me, what don't you get about I will never leave you or forsake you? What don't you get that I will never leave you nor forsake you? Yeah, but the things I've done, what don't you get that I will never leave you nor forsake you? Yeah, but this isn't what I taught. I was taught that if I send you, leave. What don't you get that I will never leave you nor forsake you? And I learned the truth that day. Because he said to me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That in those times that I feel alone, in those times that I feel far from God, I have to ask myself one question. Who moved? Who moved? Because if he promised he would never leave me, that means I moved away from him. The great thing about it is, it's impossible for me to move very far. Because every time I move, he kind of moves with me. And he moves with me because he'll never leave me or forsake me. So in those times that you feel alone and maybe then it's that moment that you feel mad at God, he's probably the most perfect person to talk to. Because he understands it. He knows it. He's right there. He's seeing it. He's in the situation with you. Hey, the greatest person to talk to when you're doing the biggest sin that you could ever imagine is God. Because he's right there anyway. You're not pulling the wool over his eyes. not getting away with one. Say, Lord, what am I doing right now? It's crazy. Why am I doing this? Why am I even thinking about doing this? Why is this going through my mind right now? In the middle of that argument where you just got to win. Lord, what am I saying right now? Why can't I just stop? Help me. Give me peace. Give me comfort. Restore joy to me. I mean, these are things, these are conversations that we can have with God because he's in it with us. Don't be home alone. Don't be home alone when he promised he would never leave you there. Amen? Father, we come to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord for this time today. We thank you that we could revisit this Christmas story and look at some things in a different way. Really find out what your word says to us today. Discover that you want to bless us lavishly. Help us to say yes. Give us the strength and the courage to follow your leading and your calling in our lives. I thank you, Lord, that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. We're blessed coming in. We're blessed going out. We thank you for protection and your safety as we travel home today in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you so much. Have a great weekend.